everyone. It's really great to be here to talk with you. I'm going to talk about um, vision challenge and visual recognition and how we can try to expand the way we teach these systems using unlabeled video. Okay, so just to make sure the stage is clear in terms of the eventual goal of these systems I'm talking about, we want to have systems that can understand images in the deepest sense possible. So be able to take a scene like this and understand its object categories, its object instances, the activities happening or that might happen, the attributes, and so on. Okay, so this is a challenge and a challenge tackled by many, many researchers in the field. And one way to look at um, what we're trying to do is to look at the benchmark data sets that really feed the algorithms to learn how to do these different recognition tasks. And so I'm showing a sampling of them here. Um, one that's driven a great deal of progress for the community includes the ImageNet data set, where given a million exemplars or more, we can train recognition systems that can categorize objects into a thousand different categories. Right? And as I'm sure many of you are aware, there's been tremendous progress in the last five years in being able to do this um, quite well. Okay, so this is exciting, and it's possible in part because of such large data sets that have been manually curated and labeled, as well as the amounts of computation we can now bring to it, um, as well as successes very relevant to this workshop in representation learning. Okay, so if you take this view of the challenge as well as how we're teaching these recognition systems, <clears throat> well, what are we, how are we teaching them? So right now, the most important way or the biggest way in which we convey information to these visual learners is through labeled exemplars. Okay, so if we want to have a system that understands the difference between dogs and boats and a thousand other things, we have curated a thousand or more images for each of those categories to teach the concept. Okay, so I will put this forth as really a limitation for what we'll be able to do going, moving on from here. Okay, so teaching a visual recognition system in this way is limiting. It's expensive. It's literally expensive. So you know the community invests hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars at this point in gathering these labeled exemplars. But more important than that, it's quite restrictive in scope. It's restricting the way we can teach these systems. It's also restricting our assumptions about what we want these systems to do at test time. And that restriction is very evident if we, we think about the status quo, um, which again is learning from these labeled examples, web photos that humans have manually tagged with their objects. These are really disembodied snapshots, right? They're moments in time in which an object usually central in the view has been photographed and then labeled. So this is restrictive if we then contrast this right away with how visual learning takes place in nature. Where we're not learning from disembodied flashcards about objects. Uh, instead, we're learning in very loosely supervised and even unsupervised ways by specifically acting and interacting with the environment. Okay, so in other words, visual learning takes place in an embodied way takes place in the context of how an agent is acting and moving in the world. And this is quite different right now in visual recognition from how our best systems learn. So a big picture goal in my group right now is to help make progress in shifting from this disembodied visual learning towards a more embodied visual learning prog uh, process. And what would this consist of? Well, it would mean being able to take account of continuous observations, long running observations, probably video, it would also mean being able to take into account multi-sensory input, not just the visual stream, but others as well. And I believe that if we do this, we'll have a lot of opportunity presented for what's possible. Um, for one, this will be, you know, we have the argument of less expensive learning, which is attractive, moving from strongly supervised to unsupervised learning. But also, again, more importantly, this ability to learn in a way that's unrestricted in its scope. So, if I have agents that can learn by experimenting and experiencing things in the world, in a sense, this is free and limitless, right, in terms of how much can be learned or um, with what amount of data. Okay, so that's the big picture goal then to think about how to bring about embodied forms of visual learning for the sake of recognition. Many ways we can go about doing this. What I'll share with you are steps we're taking to ground these visual observations, specifically in ego motion. Okay, so there's three points I want to show you. One will be learning a representation that's tied to an agent's ego motion. Then I'll build on that and briefly discuss how we can extend this to agents that are simply watching video and don't have 
specific knowledge of their own ego motion. And then finally, we'll kind of look the other way. And instead of only learning to do better things conscious of motion and embodiment, we'll look at how to use what we've learned about the right way to move in order to, to succeed online on a recognition task. In other words, to know how to move around at test time or to know where to look, given all the places we could look. So let's look then at learning representations tied to ego motion. And here I will motivate with a classic experiment from cognitive science that some of you may have seen and others not. Let me tell you in a nutshell what this experiment was about, this kitten carousel experiment. So these scientists are studying kittens and their visual development from birth. The kittens are in the dark from birth, except for about an hour at a time uh, per day, where they're on this contraption that you see sketched here. This carousel is built in such a way that you can put two animals at a time. One of those kittens will be the active kitten. And this kitten has control of its own motion in the confi confines of this carousel. The other kitten is a passive kitten who by construction, you know, look, notice his paws aren't touching the ground here, will be seeing what the active kitten sees, but is not having the same control over where it goes. So what happens in this experiment in terms of their visual development? Well, the active kitten's development proceeds normally, whereas passive kittens does not. And so there's a contrast here, not in terms of what they've experienced, or of what they've seen, but how they've experienced what they've seen. And what does it suggest for us? Well, it says that it wasn't just about the, the pixels that came in for the sake of learning, but it was about the motor experience while having those pixels come in. The active kitten, presumably here in this, well, in this experiment, is benefiting from choosing its own motion in the world, being conscious of that motion as he takes the, the different steps. So in a very loose sense, we're not kind of scientists, but we're trying to um, look at this as inspiration for what we might try to achieve in the computational models that are learning in an embodied way. Okay, so in other words, how do we get that self-generated emotion and that visual feedback and awareness into a, a modern recognition system? Okay, so the idea is then to link and convey to a learning algorithm this connection between how I move and what I see. Okay, so we'd like to bestow this information or, or force, really, the vision system to learn this connection. In order to do this, we want to look at so-called egocentric visual observations. So egocentric means self-centered. This can be done with a wearable camera on a human. So Google Glass could be this egocentric platform. Um, could also be on a vehicle. So as we'll see in some results in a moment, could be a camera perched on an autonomous vehicle, or even a handheld camera that has motion with the self. So we're going to take unlabeled video coming from such egocentric points of view, and along with it, um, sensor data external to the visual measurements that tell you about the ego motion. So this could be accelerometer data, GPS coordinates, and so on. This is what we're going to allow the learning system to build up a representation from um, in concert or prior to tackling a specific categorization challenge recognizing objects or scenes and images. <coughs> so then, how are we going to teach or require the system to pick up on this connection? We cast this in terms of a view prediction task. Okay, so it's a view prediction task that's conditioned on ego motion, where an agent needs to predict, before making a certain ego motion, what the world will look like after it makes that motion. That's what we'll require. Now let me have you kind of put your, just to kind of live through this experience, what we're going to ask the system to learn. Let's do it ourselves, right? Let's do a view prediction task ourselves, where we're sitting in this vehicle, looking out, and suppose this is the view that you encounter. Now, if you're aware of this link between how I move, what I see, then when we suppose some hypothetical 3D ego motion of the vehicle that you're sitting in, you could now try to imagine what the new view will look like. Okay. Certainly not expecting us to paint the pixels in a perfect way from this view to this imagined view. But nonetheless, there is um, background and foundational vision um, cues that would allow us to have a guess of this new view. Um, let me show you what the view happens to be in this particular case. 
And now let's think about, okay, if I have a system that knows how to predict, given this image, given that rotation, what the new view is, what is it forced to pick up on? For one, it's forced to know something about semantics, because because suppose you know seeing these lights at the intersection suggests there is a street intersection below, even though it's not observed yet. It's also forced to pick up on things about geometry. So there's a tower in the background, a tree in the foreground with the rotation large enough, this will occlude the background tower. Okay, so cues about depth, occlusions, and so on. And finally, there's cues about grouping. So symmetry cues, for example, might allow you to extrapolate and predict the other face of the building that you haven't observed. Okay, so this is, again, motivating for what what in insisting that an, and the system learn how to do ego motion condition view prediction, what properties it will also be required to succeed uh, at learning along the way. So then how do, we, how do we cast this in terms of, you know, what do we actually want to learn for the, the representation or the feature mapping function? Okay, so we're going to cast this in terms of equivariant feature learning, which is a generalization of invariant feature learning. So specifically, if I have an invariant representation, suppose I have images x and some transformations g, and I'm learning a feature mapping z, then an invariant feature mapping would discard those transformations, right? So maybe g is a shift, and I've learned a function z, where even after you shift the image x, it looks the same in my mapped space. Okay? And we're very familiar and have very good ways in which not just to hand code invariant features, but also learn them. Um, including from video. Now, what we'll use to tackle this ego motion tied representation is instead a generalization of invariance called equivariance, where we won't get discard those transformations, but we will uh, organize their effects. Okay, so now the feature mapping function z still will be learned, but also will be some simple mappings, one for every ego motion g, that organizes in a simple way here a linear equivariant mapping, um, the different ego motions that can be experienced, such that after, you know, if I have my image before and then my image after, say, that car's rotation, then I would like the features I get back not to be identical, but to be relatable by some simple transformation. Okay, so the goal then will be to learn Z and learn those mappings M. So let me show you one slide about how we implement this idea. And we're implementing it with uh, deep convolutional neural networks. Coming in, we're going to have video um, with this ego motion motor signal, which again is externally sensed from other sensors than the video. But it's unlabeled. And by unlabeled, I mean no human has touched it to say what the semantic objects are. And we'll be learning this function on the last slide called Z, where pairs of frames that are related by the same ego motion are related by the same feature transformation in this learned space. Okay, so in a 2D cartoon of this, this means that if I had some original frame from the video and I know about ego motions like moving forward, turning right, turning left, then those uh, motions will be organized with simple transformations from the original view in this learned feature space. Okay, and maybe they lay out like shown. Furthermore, we'll have learned this for all the video that we've trained with and any new individual snapshot can be mapped into this space. And now the power we have is that this understanding is there. We've insisted that we understand connection between how I move, what I see. So if the algorithm imagines what it's like to move forward from this image, we have a representation for that. Or similarly, turning left, turning right, and so on. So then the implementation of this, take the unlabeled video, together with its 3D ego motions, depicted here with the red arrows, and come back with this equivariant feature space. So we need to learn the parameters of this function as well as these matrices M, one for every ego motion G. <coughs> and in the unsupervised training then, we'll take pairs of these frames. And again, if they're similar in ego motion, they need to have similar, um, they need to be related by the same um, mapping M. So we implement this with a, a, a pair of Siamese embedding, so these are identical stacks of um, convolutional neural network that will pass either pa uh, frame from the pair through. And then for the ego motion G relating these two views, we have an additional network here that needs to take care of that transformation after which these two will be the same. 
Um, shown here is just the norm as the, the loss, but actually this is a contrastive loss. Um, yes, question. So uh, are there just uh, three motions, uh, ego motions, or there are many of them? Right, so they would be data dependent. Um, I'm showing three in this cartoon. Uh, when we implement it with the data set here, it was, a, I think it was about six. And we discovered these ego motions by clustering the sensor readings that came to us into some discrete set of ego motions. We've also played with using continuous motions and not having to do this discretization, but so far we're not getting better results by doing that. So, so yeah. in some sense, you guys have a finite number of matrices m sub g. That's right. Yeah, one for each ego motion. Yep. Yes. So for the view change, uh, it is a reprojection. So it's basically uh, just a function of the depth and also the, the viewpoint change. So uh, why are you not explicitly modeling that? Uh, yeah. Like work. Right, right. So we're not we're not measuring the depth. We're measuring just the the single two D images. Um, you can also think uh, you could you could try to explicitly extract even the ego motion from the visual signal itself. Um, what we're what we're insisting on here is the ability to do the two D view prediction um, condition on the ego motion. But you could think of the same the same framework. Um, taking depth either as part of your input as, or even part of the output that you're trying to infer. Uh, and the same motivation would hold for, for doing this. Yeah. Okay, so this is then allowing us to get back this learned representation that's ego motion sensitive. Um, we've played with it in different ways, including if we'd like to jointly train recognition models, you could try to learn parameters not just for the, the mapping, but also some classifiers at the same time. Mm -hmm or in the results I'll show you next, we can do this purely on supervised learning um, and then do some simple classification in the space that we've learned. So let me show you one kind of key result of applying this idea, where we took unlabeled video from the Kitty data set. This is a video um, captured on a vehicle where the car is driving around different, different locations in a city. Okay, so these are excerpts that we're training from. Again, they're unlabeled to our algorithm. It's just video. Um, and then the recognition task that we're trying to address here is scene classification. This is a, a challenge with about 400 different scene categories. At test time, you're given one of these images and you need to say, is it a freeway, is it a cathedral, is it a library, et cetera. So these aren't necessarily aligned in category. In fact, they're largely not. However, what we'd like to see is can we build up in the representation those foundational vision cues about semantics, context, geometry, um, such that we can succeed better on this task, particularly when we have very few labeled examples for the target task. Okay. And in one, in one result, as I'm showing here, we're looking at the accuracy, um, so higher is better, versus pulling out features from different layers of these networks. Um, the best layer among any of them for a given method is summarized here. And the baselines I'm showing you here include using a, the same architecture, but with random weights in it, using a, a well-studied a well form of um, invariant feature learning or using a, a concurrently proposed technique that also makes use of ego motion. And our results are improving on all of these baselines, um, showing the value you know, of going beyond invariant feature learning and towards equivariant feature learning and by capitalizing on ego motion. So, Moving from here um, on an ongoing work, we're thinking about not just predicting the, the relationship between pairs of these views, but also predicting the entire 3D object shape. Right, so we're tasking now our systems with learning, given one view from an unknown viewing angle, can the system reconstruct the entire view grid? So an image-based representation of the 3D shape. Yes, question. Right. I, I had a question about what you were just saying before. If you just consider the pairs of views that where one could be seen as a magnification of the other, how is it doing in terms of just the fine structure? So it would be sort of a, a subset of the views and then a subset of the way that you're looking at how well it does in those views. So let me see if I understand the question you're saying. What if we learn only from so scaling just, effect? Or yeah, like, like, like moving forward is primarily a magnification. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, for example, the hallucination of fine structure, or if it is sort of doing some of that, their way of judging just the error on that one aspect? I see. Right, so we, we have not evaluated it 
learning from you know one ego motion at a time. Um, so I don't know you know how it differs if we look only at scaling versus you know arbitrary ego motion. And as far as the fine grained structure, how much? Uh, one thing to keep in mind is we're we're doing this view prediction in the feature space rather than in the pixel space. So we don't produce images from this, although we have played a bit with you know mapping back from the embedding space. What would be the nearest image? Does it look like the right thing? And that looks okay. Uh, how fine are the structures? Depends on which version of this we're implementing. We started doing it with some rather tiny images for efficiency, so say 32 by 32. At this point, the images are 227 by 227. Um, so when you retrieve an image, it can, it can look pretty clear. Did that answer your question? All right, so we're looking now, um, and this is all I'll say about it, but just trying to um, enhance or, or make more difficult the learning challenge and still look at this in terms of feature learning in an unsupervised way. So an, a, an agent that knows how things look as it turns its head or walks all around them can then be given a new single view of an object and all the, already have hypo hypotheses about what it looks if it were to move around. Um, so I've talked about ego motion tied representations. Let me briefly address how we can uh, relax the need to have ego motion sensory data. <laughs> Okay, so what if I don't have the, the, the egocentric video together with motion sense, but I just have the, ego, the video, okay? I just have passively watched video. This is an attractive case also to deal with because of the amount of unlabeled video that exists that may not have these external sensor readings. Okay. And in looking at how to deal with this um, more general form, really, of the training process, we look as a starting point at slow, what's called slow feature analysis. So a form of invariant feature learning where in the case of learning from video, we say, okay, the, the semantic signal, the high level information is only going to change slowly over time, most of the time. Uh, whereas the pixels uh, will change with some high, high frequency. So in existing work with slow feature analysis or invariant feature learning, one can look at adjacent video frames or nearby video frames and using this assumption of temporal coherence say that, okay, in my embedding space, things shouldn't change too much. So at frame T, things should be pretty similar at frame T plus one and get a, a feature rep representation that maintains that uh, coherence. What we proposed is to expand slow feature analysis to slow and steady feature analysis by imposing a higher order notion of temporal coherence. So instead of looking at adjacent frames, we can look at neighborhoods of frames. For example, if we look at triplets of frames, we can say not only should the change uh, be slow, but the change, the, the changes themselves, the, not only from A to B should things change slowly, but the change from A to B should be like the change from B to C. And so you can see how that would allow us to express to the learning algorithm um, upon triplets of frames how things should work out in the learned feature space Z. And we can make an argument of how doing so then will maintain this notion of feature equivariance. But in this case, you'll notice learning not with that motor signal, learning just with the raw video. Uh, questions? Yes. So uh, uh, where are you doing this? In uh, neural nets or how are the... That's right. Yeah, so how is this implemented? Yeah, so this is implemented with a um, Siamese triplet embedding. So you have triple of stacks now, and then the loss is basically looking at this, yeah. Well, I don't know the size range. Ah, yeah, sorry. So like the network I briefly showed before, where there was these two stacks, one, you know, frame XT and XT plus one came in, those stacks had the same parameters, and the loss at the end in that case was um, based on the, you know, how different is the mapping for the first frame and then the second one after that linear map M. That was, so that's what we tried to minimize. Um, in this case, though it's not depicted here, things are quite similar, only now instead of two stacks, you have three because you have A, B, and C coming in, and you'd like this to be the thing that is minimized. And, and you're agnostic about like, whether you're using neural nets or some other feature? Uh, well, I mean, our only implementation of it has been in a, a, a deep network, convolutional network, but the principle of, of higher order temp temporal coherence is more general, but this is how we've implemented it, yeah. Yes? How do you ensure that the weights are all not equal to C? Mm -hmm. Right, so the, the loss is contrastive loss rather than 
the Euclidean norm on, on the difference, which in the contrastive loss you're saying, um, I would like the, the correct ones to be close and that they have negative pairs, right, that say that they should be closer than some negative pairs. It's not depicted in my slides, but we could talk about it offline if it's of interest. But the negative pairs are random pairs? These are easy negative examples? Ah, right. So, right, they're, they're random as in from the wrong ego motion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you they're easy to actually distinguish. It's completely different ego motions, right? Yeah, so one can do things like a flavor of hard negative mining where you try to focus on what are the most useful negatives to have in there. Um, <coughs> In this implementation, they were, they were random, complete. If you wanted to use fewer, or if you wanted to train more quickly, you could try to zero on the, the most useful negatives. Question? Yes. So uh, here, it seems that you're going from assuming that Z is locally constant to locally linear. Uh, why you, I mean, why stopping here? You could assume that it's locally quadratic and look at more, uh, like, you know, water plates and sure. the differences of it. Yeah. Is there some? some intuition as to why you should stop Right, here. why stop here? We do have some intuition. Um, I do think we'll get diminishing returns as we go higher. In fact, we, uh, if we want even higher orders. Uh, the reason is, at what point does this steadiness, slowness persist in temporal distance, right? So eventually things do change in video and not every, you know, so locally we can expect these kind of slow and steady changes. But as you look further out in windows of video, think of how quickly it might change these assumptions might start to break, and you're learning, you know, more poorly in an unsupervised way. So you might, yeah. So, so, so it hasn't been tried empirically, so I can't say. But this was our reasoning, at least for stopping at this point. There's also the complexity. Um, we work. We are kind of, you know, can't, it could be overcome. But in terms of having so many stacks in memory and the implementation, we need to get smarter uh, once you have not just triplets but quadruplets or so on. All right, so this allows us to be true couch potatoes, learn from unlabeled video in a, in a more passive way, but still achieve equivariant feature maps that are um, useful for recognition. So the result I wanted to highlight here looks at um, using this unlabeled video as a form of pre-training. So um, who in the room is already familiar with what it means to pre-train a representation? So it's about a third is my best guess. Let me try to depict um, briefly what this looks like. So this has been a really big success and, and very practical tool that we're capitalizing in, in on in visual recognition. And the idea is, you know, maybe I have a new task for which I haven't spent $500,000 to get labeled examples, but I have a few labels for it. Well, the, some, the, uh, the nice thing is that Empirically, people show that if I have a related enough task, for example, if my new task is related enough to ImageNet, for which there are 14 million labeled examples, then I could take a network, train it for the original task for which we do have many labels, learn its classifiers, and then treat that as a starting point to learn my new task for which labels are too few. So in other words, copy over those weights in the network and fine tune from there um, to get the classifier that supports your actual task. Okay, this is pre-training. You kind of pre-train the representation for another task. It's not the same task, but with the expectation it's related enough, and people have been somewhat surprised at what counts as related enough, then it can help you succeed at your new task better than if you just tried to train from scratch from this, where you would not succeed. OK, so that's what can be done in a supervised way. So what we're now testing is, OK, what if our Pre-training is watching this video. Okay, watching the unlabeled video, not labeled by a person, virtually free, and let that be the thing that prepares the representation that we then fine tune with the labeled data. So this is attractive for the ease and supervision. Um, one result that I'll highlight here that's most encouraging as far as how far this could take us looks like this. Okay, so what we'd really like to see happen is to push past the limits of what can be done with this heavily supervised uh, mode of learning. And can unlabeled video help us do it? So in this chart, we'll look at the accuracy for an action recognition task. So the system is given an image like the bottom left from this Pascal data set. They need to, the system has to say what action category is taking place. And if we learn just from those images, 
which are, there's very few that are labeled, then we're down here in accuracy. If we allow our system to pre-train with a video data set of YouTube data, which has minor to no overlap in actual labels with this data, then things get much better, right? So this is the power of the, the slow and steady feature analysis. And the important thing is um, that if instead I take that supervised pre-training approach that I depicted on the previous slide, where there's a related task here, it consists of a 100-way object categorization from the CIFAR data set. If I take that data and keep augmenting my pre-training for a supervised baseline, even once I exhaust all of the 50,000 images in this collection, the pre-trained representation ends up being a bit inferior to the free, unsupervised pre-training process with video. Yes, But, but uh, on YouTube, <coughs> really the data is way more, uh, way bigger, right, than C4. So did you try yeah. with like, much bigger right. uh, image narrative? Right, so, so we, we used the max of this, and I don't remember offhand how many videos, how many frames. Um, it's going to it's going to be more than fifty thousand frames. Um, but yeah, so it's a good question. You know, what do the charts look like? At what point do you saturate from the video? Because we say, oh, well, the unlabeled video is free and it's ample. We'd like to, you you know a good experiment is to see at which point do those curves flatten with more unlabeled video, right? At which point is there no new signal from just watching more of the same things? Yeah. And also the philosophical point, right? The, the kitten example that you have, like, is video, I mean, are you learning from video more because it is so much better? Or is it a better, fundamentally a better way of doing it? Ah, mm hmm Right, so you're saying equalize, equalize not just the amount of supervision, but the amount of data. Yeah, to, to test the kitten hypothesis. Yeah, so the kitten hypothesis is tested once we um, look at, I, I'd say the kitten hypothesis is tested even at the left-hand side of this curve in that for the same amount of supervision or the same, the same supervision, supervised visual experience um, for all systems is this, uh, so it's equal, we get benefit out of paying attention to how ego motion connects. No, but if the kitten could just look at the world and not uh -huh. interact with it, ah, uh -huh. right? that's, that's the hypothesis being tested. Right, right, right. Yeah, and so, you know, where we are right now, this is a bit more like a passive kitten because he's watching video rather than moving oh, around. Right. Um, so, so there is that difference, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, in the remainder, I want to highlight then um, shifting gears from learning in an embodied way towards acting in an embodied way for recognition. And here it's important to note that, as I mentioned at the onset, you know, our, our benchmark challenges are somewhat limiting our scope. And that means that at test time, they're passive and disembodied too. It means we're, we're, we have these systems that can do very well at web photo labeling. So you give us an image of an object, and the system must say what it is. Or given an image of a scene, we say what it is. But if we're active, if we have systems that understand how their motion relates to what they see, let's let the system move around and make its recognition decisions that way. This is the classic problem of active recognition, okay, which has um, history in early years of computer vision, but mostly absent from mainstream modern visual recognition today. We'd like systems that can operate on a mobile robot of any kind or, or even a robot that can manipulate an object. So don't stop at one view. Don't be passive at decision time either, but be active. So we've been exploring this, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I just want to most motivate the task, a hint of what we've done, and show you a result. Um, but this is the kind of imagery one deals with if one doesn't take web photos as the input. Okay, so these are all snapshots that we captured from a human-worn camera. Um, and what I'd like you to see in these is the difficulty in terms of ah, motion blur that's there, um, poor composition, right? These are just photos that are passively gathered from an egocentric camera. So this looks hard and bad in terms of performing recognition on such data, it's particularly when you contrast it with what the massive supervised data sets look like, that the way objects were used to seeing them. On the other hand, the whole point of active recognition is now you have this opportunity to change your observation. Okay, so I might get a view like this, 
but the agent can be intelligent about how to change its view through its own motion. So if, you know, in this cartoon, if it's looking at this object and can't tell if it's a mug or a bowl or a pan, there's a way to find out, and that is to move in the right way and disambiguate the object category. So when you build such an active recognition system, you need several components, three in fact. So one, you need perception. Again, you have some representation. You look at the scene and you have some initial uh, set of posteriors over what you're seeing. You also need now a means to do action selection. So given what we've seen, what should, how should I move next? And then we also need um, to iterate on this. We'll get some new observation. And a third component required is to do evidence fusion of everything that's seen so far. So when we looked at the literature in active recognition over the years, uh, you'll see that each of these three modules are tackled independently. And methods are really de dedicated towards doing any one in isolation. Where now we have the opportunity to think about um, learning all of these things jointly. So we've been exploring so-called end-to-end learning of an active policy to perform visual recognition. You learn the policy for how to select the action at the same time you learn the representation for the perception or for how to fuse the evidence. And with it, we can in, um, inject the notion of look ahead, as I talked about at the beginning of the talk. So how do you evaluate it? Um, I'll show you results from three tasks. So evaluation is less convenient in the active recognition setting because things dynamically change as a function of your motions. But we can use things like 360 data. So here the agent is in a 3D environment. We have a 360 panorama from all viewing angles. And we'll choose which glimpses to take within that viewing sphere over time. Um, in the second task, we have a robot with manipulating an object. And we can choose how should the robot move its hand to see the object better. And we're also looking at some recent data sets like ModelNet, which have uh, artificial objects rendered from arbitrary viewpoints. So scene recognition, object recognition, and object recognition in different active settings. And when we look at results in terms of how many glimpses do you require or how many motions do you take in the environment versus how accurate the system can do, uh, how accurate the system is at test time, what you'd like to see is a curve that goes up sharply, because it would mean with a little bit of motion and effort, things become very clear to the system. And this is where we're at. Our results here in dotted red and various baselines, passive and pre previous uh, attempts for active recognition are shown. Um, I'll show you a qualitative example of an active scene recognition system. So think of this agent dropped into a 360 panorama. The 360 panorama here consists of these little chips of different viewing angles just flattened onto the screen. And if we drop it in, maybe initially the first view is shown in this pink square. It looks like this. And at this point, the system thinks it's a restaurant or a train or a shop. It's actually wrong. It's a plaza courtyard. But within the next action, action space considered, this yellow grid, it will choose its next glimpse. And at this point, update its belief to say, well, given all these people cl tightly clustered together, maybe it's a theater, restaurant, or a courtyard. And then one more actively chosen glimpse, it decides to swing its camera upright and see the side of this building, and at this point, succeed in finding it as a plaza courtyard. Right. And similar things we can show with the, the robot manipulating an object. Okay. So um, and once you start working with dynamic objects in unlabeled video and doing active recognition of objects moving over time, it's also important to pull out which regions belong to any object. And so I'm just showing some results here from our approach in recent work where we can perform foreground segmentation in video. So making use both of the appearance as well as the motion of the object to come out with foreground masks that you see here. And this too, we're getting um, these results using um, a, a two-stream network that looks at both, again, the, both the appearance and the optical flow. Okay, so then the final thing I'll share is a result that looks not just at uh, deciding where to look for the sake of, sake of recognizing the object, but in this case, deciding where to look to help you view a video. So if you uh, capture video with a 360 camera, you're very happy about the fact that you didn't have to do work at capture time to decide where to direct the camera. Furthermore, the viewer 
of the eventual video has a lot of power in their hands to decide where to look, right? None of this has been chosen. This is also kind of a burden, right? So if you've tried to watch 360 video, you know that you know, either you're wearing your headset and doing a lot of physical motion to decide where to look, or as this slide shows, clicking around on the video to swing the camera to where the interesting content might be. So let's take the ideas, as I just described, of learning policies about where to look over time and take it to this problem where, given a 360 video, we'd like to direct a virtual camera. Okay, so decide where to point that camera over time and even how to change its field of view. This is a challenge that we've recently started working on um, and defining in terms of 360 video in and normal field of video out. And we learned this from unlabeled video. Um, in the interest of time, I'll jump to the result. Basically, we can learn what human taken videos look like just by watching YouTube. And so you give us a 360 video like this one. Here it's just flattened into the plane. Uh, and we'll select, as shown in the red outline, uh, a trajectory of viewpoints or glimpses over time that make human looking, human taken video that looks as if it were human taken. So in this particular case in the aquarium, it's chosen to look at this diver and then track it and zoom in and out accordingly. Just one of its hypotheses that it would put forward as a way to watch this uh, unlabeled 360 video. Okay. So I've talked about embodied visual learning, moving from disembodied photo labeling towards context of action and motion for the sake of training visual recognition systems. And the main ideas I showed were um, learning features tied to ego motion and learning policies that use that look ahead ability to move around intelligently. And the work that I showed you was um, done with the, the three students that you see here. With that, I stop and happy to take any further questions or comments. The ego motion data, can you treat the motion as a latent variable and then maybe do without the actual motion data? In a sense, that's what's happening in the in the um, the couch potato who learns from the the higher order temporal coherence um, because the the ego motion is not explicit. Um, right, but you don't have these transformations, so you could have the MG matrices, but just have G be a latent thing. Uh, right. I think that is possible. It's not something we've attempted, though. Yeah. And you know, furthermore, we could one could solve. One doesn't need the, the external sensor reading to solve for the ego motion. We could try to explicitly show the algorithm how to do that just from the views themselves. Um, the motivation of using the external sensor is is that idea of embodiment and having an outside read of how things are changing than the pixels. Yeah. Yes, Madi. Uh, for the ego motion, if I understood correctly, your G's are just kind of local actions. I'm just wondering, so if, if thinking about it, I don't know if this makes sense, I'm thinking about it more broadly, I mean, these G's really, I mean, they're, uh, are also, uh, they have some structure over them. So in particular, if I make two small steps, it's like one big step, or if I turn right and then left, mm -hmm. and start, so right, stay, go, you know, it can get the same point. I was wondering if you do or if it makes sense to impose an M, a decom uh, uh, composable, composability structure that matches the composability of G. Right. And if they have you know, sequence of Gs, then if they compose the M, the sequence of Gs that get me to the same place, compose the Ms. Right, right. That's right. We thought a little bit about this. So the, the set of Gs, um, you know, they are composable. And so it's some, so if we wanted the minimal set of Gs, we could take those that, you know, or express all the ego motions through composition. Um, and we thought about this in terms of, you know, how big, one, if we do discretize the space, you know, how big should it be, how many should there be? And we looked, we've looked a little bit at preserving equivariance for those motions which are in our set G versus those that are compositions of G. And empirically, as you might expect, you know, we best preserve equivariance for those that we directly are representing, but we still maintain equivariance a shade, you know, a shade more poorly for those that are compositions of those Gs. Yeah, but it might be, it could be an interesting problem to think about the vocabulary of ego motions and explicitly in terms of the composition um, or perhaps learning the vocabulary of ego motions that belong in this, in this learning process itself. Yes, sounds good. All right.
Everyone's schedule after this.